desire and take a true heart to confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I say I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sins. <clears throat> Almighty God, merciful Father, I am poor and miserable sinner. Confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you. And just to deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent for them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, and bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the Word, Announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh wait, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Rise up and come to our help. O God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but then you planted, you afflicted the peoples, but then you set free. But you have saved us from our foes, and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Glory be to the Father. And to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Awake. Oh, Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. For our soul is now down to the dust. Rise up. It shall not return to be empty, but it shall accomplish 
that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy, and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall bring forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let your enemies know that you alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. O oh God, make them like the world of dust, trash them before the wind. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 
40 laps this last one. Three times I was beaten with rocks. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not mine. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up in the paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So, to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. <laughs> the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to Jesus, he said in a miracle, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path that was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit is not mature. As for that in good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, Hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. God has made us his own people by our baptism in Christ, moving together in trust and hope we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who 
Unbeliever 
The greater point is that the miracle of this parable is it's all about God's grace and God's mercy. And it's the twin to last week's story about the landowner who is perfectly willing to waste an entire day's wage on a person who worked only one hour. Today that landowner is a farmer, a sower, and he is the kind of person who strikes fear in the heart of everybody who builds a garden or who puts in crops of any sort in our day and age because what strikes me about this text is just how indiscriminately reckless the sower is with his seed. He throws it absolutely everywhere. He doesn't care how much he uses. He doesn't care where it goes. And we've already talked about the four kinds of soil it falls on. And it only grows to maturity in one of them. Not a great harvest response there. But the surprising thing is that the sower just doesn't care. He wants to throw that seed absolutely everywhere. If it falls on the path, that's fine. If it falls on rocky soil, no big deal. If it falls among the thorns, hey, that's all right too. If it falls on the good soil, well, that's great. But it's not great because of the results that it produces. It's great because the sower really, literally wants the seed to fall on every conceivable surface possible. Doesn't make much sense, does it? We got a bunch of seed catalogs in our house last week. My uh, son-in-law is a landscaper by trade. He grew up in a farming family. His father was a a uh, potato farmer back in Idaho, and Philip likes to grow stuff. And so he plants out every year this section in our property now that he's got for his garden. And he's got it all mapped out. He's going to plant here, and he's going to plant there, and he's going to plant everywhere. And as a result of what happened last year's crop, the, what he planted, so he's changing things up a bit. And he's got plants now, he's going to get that soil ready and everything else. So when it comes time to plant, you get stuff in, get irrigated, and everything else. Well, we were sitting at the table for breakfast one day, and he was going through those seed catalogs, making markings and all of them, and I said, Philip, I've been studying this text for Sunday about the sower goes out and sows the seed. Do you know the story? He said, yeah, I know it. And I said, Philip, I would rather, instead of spending all that time doing all that planning for that garden, why don't you just do it like Jesus does it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, why don't you just get a great big old bag of mixed kinds of seeds, or get all the seeds you can order, and put them in a great big bag, and you just go out and you start throwing them everywhere. I can imagine, Philip, you could see, you could throw seeds so that it ends up on the top of the barn, it ends up in the garden, messing up the marigolds and the other plants that we've got out there. I've got imagination of seed between the apple trees and the pear trees on that little orchard section we've got, and seed among the branches of the trees, seed just about everywhere in the pasture out on the other side of our backyard, and he looked at me and he said, are you nuts? <laughs> but that was what would happen if the parable and the sower was in charge of the garden at our it would be a downright mess. I guarantee you, my son-in-law is not planting that way. <clears throat> but he doesn't plant like Jesus. You see, the truth is, Jesus just doesn't care where his word goes, or who hears it, or whose hearts it falls on. We can mock him all he wants for the restless, reckless love that he has for us, but he's still going to sow his seed. He'll throw it anywhere he can get it. He'll proclaim his word to anyone who's within earshot. He'll proclaim it to those we want to have in church with us, and he'll proclaim it to those we don't want to have in church with us. He'll proclaim it to the good and the bad and the ugly, everyone for whom he shed his blood. And since Jesus shed his blood for every person, everybody means everyone. He is completely intent 
on his goal of making sure that every single person hears his word of life. And he's not about to let any of the things we think that we know get in the way. Church history, I think, bears it out. Some of the greatest figures in church history are people who we probably wouldn't want to spend a whole lot of time with. Think for instance about the early church of this man named Paul, who after the, res after the resurrection of Jesus went around arresting people who followed after Peter and the other apostles who came to believe in Jesus as the risen Lord. He arrested people right and left. He had arrest warrants in his hand when he was on his way to Damascus. And that kind of fellow was the one that Jesus stopped on the road to Damascus and said, I want you to go in my name and preach to the Gentiles. Well, you heard how Paul ended up in the gospel read in the epistle reading today. You know, St. Augustine, right? Great Christian hero, confessor of the faith. He was a philandering pagan and chosen as one of the greatest anti and chosen as the follower of one of the greatest anti-Christian philosophers and scholars of his day. Martin Luther, he was a law school dropout before he had that anxiety experience in the middle of the storm and said, as he prayed to St. Anne, I will become a monk. One of the greatest pastors in the early Missouri Synod, Friedrich August Kramer, served time in a German prison for treason. But in each and every case, God's Word worked in those men and made them people that we have a tendency to love and respect. Them. The seed fell on them, found good soil, and even though the eyes of people would have probably seen nothing in them at first, God used them for his own purposes. Which is, of course, the way the Word of God always works. God's Word does exactly what he sends it out to do. Isaiah said, Just as the rain and the snow come down from the sky and do not return, unless they water the earth and make it give birth, and cause it to sprout, and it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so it will be with my Word that goes from my mouth, it will not return to be empty. Rather, it will accomplish whatever I please. And it will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. God makes that promise through Isaiah. But his word is not something we can expect from the word of anybody else. The ordinary word of an ordinary person, apart from inspiration of the Holy Spirit, can't be counted on. I can't count on your word and you can't count on mine. It will do what it does, your words and my words, but what it does may or may not have anything to do with the intent of the one who wrote it or spoke it. But God's word is different. It's infinitely better and more effective than any word of any person. It does just what he wants it to do every single time it's proclaimed. Think about it. God's law always, always, always condemns us in our sin. And God's gospel always, always, always offers life to everyone who hears it. And those things are true every single time. And God's seed never falls somewhere or by chance or accident or mistake. It is always sown exactly where the sower wants to be sown. The fact that that may be a little bit confusing to us and why we can't understand why God would do things that way doesn't matter at all. That person that you think might be a lost cause, well, he or she might just be the next Luther or Augustine, and even if they aren't, still they're a person for whom Jesus shed his blood. <clears throat> they're a person upon whom God has set his love upon before time existed, before the foundation of the world were laid, before he ever breathed life into Adam. And when it comes down to the good of someone who is that important to the creator of the universe, well, God's not going to care too much about how reckless we may think he is about how he shows his seed. There's another aspect of the parable we should probably, probably also consider for a moment. The fact is that many, perhaps most of those who hear the word of God will not be good soil. They will either ignore it because the devil takes it from them, or their faith will die because of the distractions and cares of life, Jesus says, or 
their faith will shrivel because it doesn't have any root. Now, Jesus says that that's going to happen. But he never tells us, now listen, he never tells us that we should be agonizing over that. It's just the way things are. So what if the person that you're trying to talk to is rocky or thorny soil? What if the person that you're proclaiming the seed of the word to is just a hard path? Those are the wrong questions. They shouldn't be taught by us, let alone asked. Because the Lord has only told us one thing with absolute clarity, and that's He wants the seed sown. That means He wants it on the head. He wants it sown in the rocks. He wants it tossed in the thorns. It's not given to us to know what He's going to do with the word that He sows. It's only given to us to sow it. To throw it everywhere, to proclaim it, to broadcast it all the time. Because God himself is the one who gives growth according to his good pleasure. God himself is the one who caused the seed that he's planted to grow, and it grew in you a hundredfold. God himself is the one who waters you, who nurtures you. God himself is the one who will come on the last day to harvest you so that you may live with him in the new creation for all eternity. And that... That is what Jesus wants to teach you through the parable. That he loves all people. That's why Jesus went to the cross and suffered all of God's wrath against each and every sin. And it's also why he wants to make his way to each of them with his words so that they might come to know and believe and trust that they are one of the precious children for whom he went to the cross. Because we know that he loves all people. We also know that he loves you. Yes, you in particular. And that's why his word has been sent to you. And through which you receive all his good gifts. And even eternal life and salvation. For that, rejoice. Because your sins are free. And you are free. And you are his forevermore. Peace of God that surpasses all of our understanding will meet your heart and mind in Christ. Until by our last. Let us rise and pray for ourselves and for all God. Lord of the we thank you for all of your tender mercy. And plant in us your holy word so that in good and honest hearts we may keep your word. Lord of the harvest, send the workers in the harvest that we may be preserved in the pure teaching of your saving word, whereby faith for you is strengthened, charity increased in us toward all, and your kingdom extended in all the world. Bless all Christian homes that your word would be sown and produce much fruit. Grant health and prosperity all who are in authority, especially our president, governor, and all those who serve in our armed forces, and do them with wisdom, so that they may serve to the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance and punishment of wickedness, that we may lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. Be with all those who are in trouble, want, sickness, anguish of labor, peril of death, or any other adversity, especially those who are suffering for your name and truth. Comfort, O God, with their Holy Spirit, that they may receive and acknowledge their afflictions and manifestations of your fatherly will. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth and your life, we thank you for all the mercies you grant to our brother Jeffrey Thompson during his earthly life, especially for calling him to faith in Jesus. Comfort the survivors who mourn his death with the hope of a glorious resurrection and a joyful reunion in heaven. He was mindful that we are mortal so that we will ever be prepared to die in the faith and finally receive the glory promised to all who trust in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus, he instituted the office of the public ministry and instructed your church to call ministers of your word. Having prayed for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, we have called Pastor Reverend Brendan Bowles to proclaim your saving gospel among us. 
assist him to recognize the needs of our congregation and the welfare of your kingdom, and if it be your will, grant that he accept the call to serve among us. Lord of the harvest, grant that in true faith we may go worthily to your altar to receive the very body and true blood that your Son has given us for our redemption. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, who has sown your holy word among us, prepare our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that we may diligently and reverently hear your word, keep it in good hearts, and bring forth fruit with patience, that we may not incline to sin, but subdue it by your power. And then all persecutions comfort us with your grace and your constant help. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. John Gabriel sing the offer.
broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Bravo.